Recording. Terrific. Hello, everyone, and welcome to SCORE Fairfield County's live webinar on how to develop a business plan in six easy steps. I'm Tim Ryan, the webinar coordinator and a business mentor here at SCORE Fairfield County. I'll be your host. Our presenter today is John Harmon. More on John in just a minute. First, some brief information on SCORE. We have 320 offices, over 11,000 volunteers nationwide, and we're part of the Small Business Administration. SCORE Fairfield County has over 130 volunteers with a wide range of industry, process, and subject matter expertise. We offer three primary value-added services to small business owners, free one-on-one -on -one counseling, educational workshops and webinars, over 150 per year, and extensive resources on our website, including a network of experts, as well as templates to build your business plans and your financial projections, etc. For our next webinars, I would suggest you check out our calendar at our website for other upcoming webinars. New events are being added daily. Some more info, useful information about today's event. We have set aside time for questions and answer at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, please use the chat window at any time during the presentation. It's located in the lower part of your screen. Our webinar will end sharply at one o'clock to respect your time. The session is being recorded and the link to the recording will be available at fairfieldcounty.score.org within the next couple of days. Now our speaker. John Harmon is a, a SCORE volunteer. He's a managing director of Agilent Consulting Services, which advises small and medium-sized businesses on strategies for growth and operating excellence. John has held senior leadership and executive positions in sales, marketing, quality management, strategic planning, and a new business development at Eastman Kodak, the Gardner Group, and Pitney Bowes. So now, Here's Johnny. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. And welcome, everyone, to uh, Six Easy Steps. Um, first of all, I should tell you that this workshop I've delivered typically to a live audience, and we've had a couple hours to do that. We have a shortened amount of time. I'll make sure that I try and be as brief as I can. Um, it's also the first time I've had to deliver a, webs uh, a webinar in the coronavirus era, uh, and that's been weird for all of us, I'm sure. But in some ways, I'm getting used to sheltering place. It's cheaper, and I'm still healthy. So, I, and I hope you all are too. So, let's walk through the business plan in six easy steps. Um, first of all, I should tell you that this is not designed for you to create a leather-bound version of. Uh, business plan that's been vetted and is appropriate for the library. It, it, is, it should be a very useful tool for you. It doesn't have to be complete. It doesn't have to be shared with anybody but yourself. I think a lot of people who think about business plans think of what uh, lenders might require. And while that might be true, in this case, uh, that won't be the focus. It's what do you need to do to either start your business or what do you need to do to continue your business on a trajectory that you uh, are comfortable with? Um, I mentioned that there's, this, there's six steps to this. I call them easy. In, they're easy in the sense that they're pretty well under, uh, understandable. Not so easy to actually do. Uh, but again, you have lots of time. And I must say that the most important thing you can do following this webinar is not just taking into consideration the learnings, but seek out a business mentor. I think they can really help you with some of the details. They can respond to the work as you make it. Um, so this is not meant to be a one and done experience. So we'll go through the six steps. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about how you can analyze your business, that is analyze the results of this plan as you put it together. And then I'll end up with a final closing channel, a challenge. So what's a business plan? Well, first of all, it's a matter of identifying what your business objectives are. Now, these objectives should be quantifiable, but 
they don't necessarily need to be classic in the sense that you want to grow to be a Google or you want to be uh, the biggest and the best business in the world. You may have re relatively modest objectives. You may want uh, a business that helps you keep a living wage. You may want a business that allows you to have a full-time job but work on the weekends. You may want your business to start from zero and grow to millions of dollars. All of those objectives are yours and for your definition. Some of them are personal, but if you can't quantify them, they're probably not all that useful to establish as an objective itself. So set objectives, we'll talk a little bit more about that. We'll also talk in detail about how you do that. What do you have to do? Uh, who has to do it? When, at what cost? Um, many of you are starting a business out, so that's one discussion. I'm gonna try to drop in examples for those of you who may be in business and may need a plan. Uh, your business may have been uh, able to exist without one, but I, I will tell you that if you want a stable business, if you, if you want your current business to grow, if you want your current business uh, to develop a higher profitability, you're gonna need a plan and that's what this is all about. And once we've described how the business plan works, we're gonna talk about metrics, monthly metrics for you to stay on track. So here are the six steps. First of all, you have to analyze your market and your business. So this is often something that even current businesses don't do all that well, maybe because they think they already know it, but I will tell you that uh, it, it's really important that you go through in a, in a diligent way and identify all of the aspects of your market. This is something that not just startups do, this is something that large companies do each and every year. And they go through the same questions, uh, not because uh, they, they think the answers they gave last year were bad, but things change. It's important that you understand that. Uh, understanding your marketing position is the next step. What does that mean? We'll talk more about it. And then getting into more detail about sales and earnings goals. Now, I will tell you that people, uh, businesses that are just starting up, this is an extremely difficult process. How do you know what your goals ought to be? And I realize that it's difficult. I also realize that you gotta start somewhere. So even best guesses are better than doing nothing at all. Because in some ways, in order for a plan to be achievable and work, you have to understand what your goals are. You have to understand how to count them. You have to understand where you might be off or on compared to what the plan says. We'll talk a little bit about an action plan. What are the five top things you need to th think about in, in executing any plan? And then we'll go to, into some details around the P&L and the cash flow projection. So those are the six steps. First step, uh, data and market analysis. Um, again, this is something that not many companies do with thoroughness, but it's really important. So what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, what's the market size? This may be a less important question for some of you, particularly those of you who, who are in uh, businesses that, that are mature, uh, where everything is pretty well known already, but understanding things like growth and the segments that you need to participate in is an important part of this, that exercise. We'll get into more on segments in a few slides. Uh, purchase drivers, what, what are the things that your customers respond to most? It may be quality, it may be cost, it may be service. So as an example, um, one of the, as one of the important elements in home decorating or home refurbishment business is not just the quality of the work, but do, do the laborers show up on time? And are they neat? Why is that? Because most of the customers are women and they are looking for somebody who doesn't trape a lot of dust and mud into their house and who are polite and responsive. So it's an example of a purchase dri driver that may not be obvious, but it's an important element of why people decide on whether you are the person to deliver that service. Uh, demographics, um, you may have a business that focuses in on certain age ages or certain genders or certain lifestyles. It's all important you understand what your customer looks like. This is also true of businesses. What kind of businesses are you trying to attract? Are they local? Are they national? Do they require a high level of service uh, or is it just a matter of getting the product to them on time 
what is what do they look like who are your competitors this is often something that many startups don't do well enough um, uh, the standard res response I hear from startup businesses is, oh, well, I don't have any competitors, I, I, I must say. Yes, you do. And the key is to make sure you understand who they are. These might be direct competitors. If you're in the shoe business, it may be other shoe businesses. It may also be indirect competitors, which is to say clothing businesses uh, that may offer shoes or could offer shoes. So important you understand both the direct and the indirect competitors. What are the distribution channels? By that, I mean, what are the ways in which you communicate with customers or prospects? And what are the ways in which you deliver the product or service that you're offering? Um, everybody knows about the internet, that's fine, but there are other ways of delivering that message. There are other ways of delivering products and services that you need to define and be able to, to make sure that you're delivering that commensurate with the efficiencies and the characteristics of the channel. Seasonality, regionality, almost every business has them. Uh, when I was in the equipment business, about 40% of the sales uh, were done in the last quarter of the year. Why? Because they, they were very budget sensitive. And in order to spend money, they ha had to make sure that they, their budgets were available for, for that spend. And then finally, what are the key marketing drivers? What are the general characteristics of your market and how do, they, uh, how do they show themselves and how you run your business? There are a variety of uh, data sources. Um, the internet is a great source. Uh, often uh, it's not used the way it, it could be. It's not used to uh, say, uh, compare your website to another's website or what competitors are offering or saying. The libraries have plenty of information regarding this and most business librarians are eager to help people who walk in and have a question about their industry or about certain aspects of their business. Uh, there is a government website. It's actually www.census.gov. That contains the NAICS codes, the North American in, in Industry uh, Categorization System. That is a list of all industries in the United States in Canada and Mexico. What are the industries? And then what particular companies are in that industries? How do they describe themselves? It's important that you understand who your competitors are. It's important that you understand what industry you find yourself in. That could very well help your marketing. It also could help your selection of products and services. Uh, trade associations and shows are another great data source. Trade publications. Uh, market research is generally pretty expensive. Uh, so I don't uh, usually recommend it, but there could be market reports you could find on the internet you could use to help you understand characteristics of your market. Competitor data, uh, we talked a little bit about this, uh, but who, who, who are their target customers? Are they directly your competitors? Are they indirectly? Uh, what other product range and features? That may very well help you fine tune and hone your products and services. One of the things I find in uh, startups, particularly startups, is that they're in the service business, but they haven't precisely defined enough what their service is specifically and why it's compelling. Why does it uh, attract somebody uh, to, to the service? Uh, products are a little less difficult just because a widget is something you can look at, hold, turn around, investigate, but services are a little bit more difficult to define. It's really important that you understand what they are and whether they make sense to your potential customers. Um, what's the price? What's the quality, the size, service plans and reputation? What other kinds of services do your competitors offer that you might want? So for instance, you may offer a particular uh, product like for instance, uh, industrial supplies, but you may also want uh, a service to go along with that, a service to help customers understand how they could select through what you have to offer, but also how they're gonna get the product on time, how they're gonna get the product uh, that they ordered, how they're gonna get billed on time. All these things are important that you understand your competitors doing and you need to think about doing them yourselves. What's your marketing strategy? Uh, what's the message that you wanna 
to generate. We'll talk more about this on another slide, but what's the, mark, uh, the, what's the message you want? And what are the channels you're gonna use to get that message? Is it primarily through the internet? Is it primarily through social media? Is it through your network of contacts? Is it through trade publications or ads? W what is it? And then finally, what are your, channel, uh, your sales and channel strategies? And the sources of this are very similar to what you have for market information. The internet is a great source. Uh, if you're in the retail business, you could be a customer. If you're offering uh, clothing, say, go to retail stores and shop around. Look at what those retail stores are offering. Look at the price. Uh, understand the various suppliers you've got. All of this is, is uh, uh, essential to both starting a business and maintaining a business and your SCORE mentor can help you with these details. Um, the SWOT analysis, you may not have heard this. This is a tool primarily used by large companies and they, they use it because uh, portions of their company don't know what other portions are doing. And it's very hard to bring together a common view of what the business is like and what the opportunities are like until you bring people together using this tool. This is not totally useless for uh, startups. Um, and I'll tell you uh, the, the best way to use it, but let's go through what the tool is. First of all, you look at internally, what's your business about? What are the strengths of your business? And what are the weaknesses of your business? And you'll probably come up with a whole list of items that you're gonna have to winnow down to the ones that are most important. You see the underlines of those uh, where they start out with uh, six or seven strengths or weaknesses and they underline the weaknesses that are most important in that category. Uh, externally, what are the opportunities and what are the threats? Um, again, uh, tr try to identify uh, what they are and then winnow them down to the most important. Um, I think th the best example of threats is what happens under uh, th the era of the coronavirus. Um, businesses are going to have to adapt differently the question is, how does this affect how you start your business? How does this affect what you run your business? And understanding those threats uh, well helps you identify opportunities you can focus in on. And if those opportunities require you to strengthen a weakness, then that's what you do. So all of this, all these sections are ways for you to analyze your business. Um, I will add this one final thing. It's important that you be clear and you be honest about what you think each of these categories are for you. It's also important, if you can, to try to quantify. So for instance, if you think your cost structure is too high, well, what is your cost structure now? How does it compare to your competitors? And what should it be? Uh, it's just another example of quantifying what amounts to a qualitative statement around the, the aspects of your business. And Here's a, a, a chart you can use where you identify uh, market trends, competitive trends, what's working in your business, what's not. Um, it, it's, a, it's a cheat sheet, if you will, that you can fill out and share with your SCORE mentor. Uh, so that's the first step. Second step is to find your marketing position. Uh, to some extent, I'll repeat a little bit about what I've already talked about, but it's important that you spend a lot of time on this. Um, there's such a thing as the five P's. This is a little bit of an old paradigm, but it's still useful. And the five P's are positioning, which is to say, uh, wh 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 who's your target market? Who are your competitors and what's your advantage? What is your product or service? Again, for some of you, that product, that service may not be clear enough for customers to understand, and it may not be compelling enough. So you have to fine tune what that looks like. What's the price? Pricing is the most difficult thing I've ever experienced in marketing. Uh, it's, it's a challenge that even older established businesses have to go through. What's the price? Is it right? Is it too low? Is it too high? Have I included other things in the price that ought to be a part of the analysis that you bring to the product and what your customers may see? Places, distribution channels and geography and finally promotion. Uh, advertising, PR, etc. Most people think, not most people, but many people think that marketing is promotion. And of course, it includes promotion, but it's also much more including those other four pieces. So uh, target markets. Uh, I mentioned market segmentation here because everybody, every business 
has several segments to their business. What's a segment? It's a segment that has its own characteristics, uh, separate from other segments. And there may be some segments in your business that are more important for you to spend time on now and less important later. It may, there may be other segments that are really important down the road, but once you establish yourself, but you need, need to identify what these look like. And what do they look like? Well, demographics, as we pointed out, um, geography, some, some benefits, uh, lifestyle as, uh, uh, aspects, psychographics, which is the mindset that goes into decision-making about what, why customers buy. So as an example, uh, a segment might in the building trade industry might be uh, high-end customers who are building a house new or who are refurbishing a house and the house is in the millions of dollar range. That's a segment that's different from uh, the middle income uh, segment that, that may have a, a, a house that's worth much less, but they may have the same kinds of refurbishing. You may vary your offer in terms of the cost of, of, of the product itself or the labor or the attention you pay for it. But each of these segments, you may want to serve at one particular time or another. You just need to distinguish one from the other. Uh, the psychographics has to do with um, the mindset of the buyer. Uh, I, a favorite example of mine is uh, the car industry. So uh, those, uh, the, the, the high-end car manufacturers, I'm speaking now about the Mercedes and the BMWs, part of why customers buy those cars is not just because they're well engineered or they're fast or they look great, because they give the buyer a certain status and credibility. And uh, you can't really uh, uh, quantify that, but it's there. And you may also find people who are interested in uh, uh, battery powered car cars and they wanna be perceived as eco-friendly. All those are psychographic elements that go into decision making, and it's how you position and market yourself within that context. Uh, so uh, the, the the bottom line is what what you're trying to do in marketing is come up with an understanding of why customers want to spend their money on your product and your service. There needs to be some something about that that you think your customers find attractive. It, it, it may be that you happen to have the best corner uh, in the city for people to drive by, park, pick up, and leave. That may be a real competitive advantage. Uh, it may be uh, speed of service. It may be reliability. Uh, if you buy my product, I, I make sure you get it when I say, when you, when you want it. It's going to come without any problems. Uh, you're going to receive a bill quickly. Uh, I'm going to respond to any customer questions you have, any customer service issues. It could be that that level of service is the most important thing you can provide, and it distinguishes you from your competitors. But think about why you think you are so different that people are willing to spend a dollar with you and not with somebody else. Um, Here's another way of looking at customers. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid this is something I put together, but it's probably useful enough, and it really relates uh, more to people who have been in business for a little while. And there are ways to prioritize your customers. One, uh, the, the most important, is growth customers. What customers will allow you to grow where you are uh, most attractive, where you have the best competitive advantage, those are the ones you want to try and go after. Now, that may not be the first set of customers you go after because you're just starting up. Or you have to rely on um, uh, 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 customers that help you step your way toward that growth. So as an example, I may start in the roofing business, but I'm going to graduate to, uh, to be a full uh, refurbisher of um, higher income homes. Um, there are also something I call bread and butter customers. These are customers that are going to come your way anyway. Uh, you don't have to worry about uh, spending a lot of time on marketing to them. They're going to walk through the door. 
That doesn't mean you can't satisfy them. You should, but you don't have to spend a lot of time uh, uh, trying to describe who you are and what you are because they're already there. They, they, they like you anyway. And then finally, there are what I call undesirable customers. Now, those of you who are just starting out probably don't know who these customers are, but I can tell you that those customers are probably going to be very keen on getting the lowest price possible. They're going to be very keen on complaining to you about whatever, whatever it is you, you're delivering to them. And they're going to be not all that caring about remaining with you. Um, the key is to try to find out who these customers are as soon as you can, because you can waste a lot of time uh, trying to please customers who either can't be pleased or can never make money on. So these are the kinds of customers you're likely to find. And as you're starting out, you ought to be looking for these kinds of customers and, and, and when they make themselves uh, uh, apparent to you. So uh, another little worksheet here on position your company, who's your target, who are your competitors, uh, what's your advantage? What, how, how do you uh, uh, compare to your competitors? And those advantages need to be structured or described in the way of benefits, not just uh, features like speed or reliability. It's, it's, it's what the customers perceive as, is, as those features relate to their benefits. So th those are the first two things, analyzing your market, defining your marketing position. Uh, th the next step is to try to define your year sales and earnings goals. Now, those of you who are just starting out will find this extremely difficult to do, and I'm with you. I understand it's awfully difficult, but it's, it's important that you try and at least guess. Uh, your guesswork is going to be likely to be wrong, a lot of it, but at least you know what's wrong and how to change it as opposed to uh, being completely uh, and constantly in the dark about where you're going and how you're doing. Um, so uh, here's a way to look at, at your projections. And this is true for both people in business and people starting businesses. What is your sales revenue projected over the period of a year if you can do it over uh, uh, 18 to 24 months, even better, although the further out you are, the more speculative it becomes. So not just what are your sales, but how many things are you selling? How many widgets? If you're selling a project, well, how many projects do you expect to sell? What are the size of these projects? How many hours do they consist of? Uh, in the consulting business, I can tell you that these projects can vary wildly from an introductory, uh, 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 let me analyze your business, it won't cost you a lot of money, uh, but at least based on this, you may find some things that you might wanna take action on coming out of this analysis. So, and that gets you into a project of some kind. But the first piece is to try to identify what that introductory project might look like or what that introductory offer might look like and then how you graduate from that introductory offer to something uh, a, a little bit more reliable and clear down the road. But it's important that you count it. How many jobs, how many widgets, what's the price? And you'll find that your offering probably consists of four or five of these things Either there are four or five different kinds of widgets or four or five different kinds of services, but try to identify what they look like. And if you're wrong, that's okay. At least you understand how you've quantified it and then how you need to change as you learn more down the line. Um, so sales, price, frequency. And you'll find that there'll be some seasonality in many of this. Many of this. So it could be that uh, the winter time is simply not when you have a lot of sales. Okay, if you know that, then you can start thinking about how you market yourself during these down periods to the where you can take most advantage of the sales that might occur during the summertime. So seasonality, a, fre a frequency of business is all a part of how you count what your what your business looks like. Um, so. And I, I, sh I should say one more thing. Um, w w when you do this, you're going to want to be most precise in the near term. Um, and um, for 
people starting up, two things are usually things that are undercounted or underrepresented. One is the time it takes to get that first sale or the first group of sales. Typically, unless you already have uh, some customers who you know and you can start serving immediately, it takes three or four months for you to really get underway, during which time, of course, you need to spend marketing yourself. That marketing might involve calling friends and neighbors. It might be doing some kind of a digital um, uh, social media blitz. It could be a lot of different things, and we'll get into that further down. But I want you to know that, 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 that this often is something that startup businesses uh, underrepresent. The second thing is startup costs and operating costs. Um, one, of the, one of the things that most, almost all startup businesses experience is, misunder is understating their operating costs. It might be inventory, it might be the cost of equipment or machinery, it could be setting up a website, it could be a lot of different things. But generally, those costs are underrepresented. And as a result, what you've underrepresented is the amount of money you're going to need to start your business and the amount of money you're going to need to maintain your business, particularly in the first three or four or five months when the revenues are not nearly going to be what you need. So make sure that you plan carefully for that. Your SCORE mentor can be very helpful in helping you with these, uh, these costs and uh, with these delays in startups. So uh, those are the projections. Um, the next thing is once you understand your market, once you understand your positioning, who your competitors are, where you stand, some of the threats, some of the, uh, uh, the, the external threats and opportunities out there that, that uh, could either help your business or hurt your business. And once you've identified some kind of a goal, that you've, you've set for yourself, well, now what? What do I do? Well, that comes in with developing an action plan. And that action plan, very simply, consists of four big questions. <clears throat> um, well, what am I going to do, first of all? And it could be what you're going to do is to fine tune your product or service. Uh, maybe you don't have the right supplier yet. Uh, the supplier you have is in China and not very reliable, or it costs too much money, or you need some help uh, in, help, in, in fine-tuning and delivering your product or service. What is it? And then how important is it? So there's going to be, if I can just move forward for a second, I'll move back. So it, it, it could be sales and those who can help your sales. It could be related to production or logistics or inventory and supplier management. Uh, how, how are you going to get your inventory? Where are you going to get it? How reliable is it? What's it going to cost? Once I get it, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to store it or am I going to sh ship it directly to a customer? Um, am I going to require any additional information around the delivery of my service? Am I going to require that I that I uh, invest in some internet service that is a part of what I offer, and how reliable is that, and how easy and how I should how should I make it available to my customers? Quality control and customer service. Uh, how can I be sure that what I offer is going to be a consistent, high, reliable quality? Um, and what about the delivery of that service? How can I make sure that, that, that whatever ever I offer gets to the customer in a reliable, fast, efficient way? And if there are questions the customer has, uh, how do I make myself available to answer those questions? It could be that the best way to do that is through chat on, on the internet. It could be some kind of a help desk service. Uh, it could be some kind of a brochure or manual that you provide to your customers. But in some one way or another, you got to make sure that your quality is maintained and that you have uh, services available for your customer to make sure that they get what they're expecting. Uh, billing and accounts receivable. Um, I've had several clients 
by the way, that don't haven't not paid attention to this. Uh, if if you are not a cash business, if you're going to rely on billing your customers, you better make sure that you get the bills out, those invoices out, because that's the way you're paid. And if they're they're not delivered fast and correctly, uh, there's going to be a delay in what you can expect in the way of cash back. And all this billing does relate directly to accounts receivable. Um, many invoice based businesses don't pay attention to their accounts receivable. They assume, hey, I've already delivered my service, I sent my product, and I'm sure I'll get the cash one way, one day or another. When they find that the cash doesn't arrive for 30 or 60 or 90 days, they get into a cash pinch. And this is money that customers owe you. You've already done the service for them and they're sitting on that money. You might wanna make sure that you have all the tools in place for you to, to, to make sure the customers pay you quickly, accurately, on time. There, you could have uh, office space or retail location uh, questions. Many businesses don't need some kind of a storefront, but some do. And you may also want some temporary, or I should say um, uh, occasional location for your business. There are services that allow you to rent off spa office space or uh, rent some help desk capabilities so that if people want to actually show up, there's a place for them uh, and you to receive them. Um, th there are a lot of different ways that you, you can uh, identify space for your business. In addition, of course, to the virtual space, as we know so well through uh, services like Zoom. And then technology management. Uh, most businesses rely to some extent on technology. That might be a website, that might be social media, uh, that, that might be an efficient way to deliver information. It might be to help you manage your own internal operations efficiently. Uh, and since technology changes all the time, it's important that you understand your technology infrastructure and to make sure that it's up to date and well functioning, uh, else you'll be inefficient or you won't be able to meet the needs of your customer. So with this action plan involving uh, operations, sales, marketing, product management, identify the four or five most important things you need to get done and identify some priority. What's the most important thing you need to get done now? And that may relate to the next most important thing or it, it, it may be that now that you've done the most important thing, you have enough cash or you have enough credibility or enough presence to do the second thing. So um, a, a, a good example would be sales or marketing. It could be the most important thing you need to do as a startup is to get yourself known. And the most, the easiest way to do that, not in every case, but certainly the easiest way to do that is through your own network. It doesn't cost a lot. Um, it, it, people know you, or at least they can refer to you. Uh, you don't have to build a fancy website. You don't have to build some kind of a, uh, of a significant technology infrastructure. It's you calling up friends and friends referring you to others. That's probably the most important, the cheapest thing you can do to start out first. The next thing is once you have uh, used that network, well, what's the next thing? The next thing may be to improve your website or it may be to establish yourself in social media. But each one of these things has a priority. It's gonna require that you do it or you find somebody else to do it. Uh, there's some kind of a due date where you expect this thing to get done and there are costs. So costs play heavily into priorities. It could be that something is a high priority but it costs too much money, in which case it drops to a lower priority. So each one of these things need to be analyzed. Um, you may find that the most important thing you could do is to ally with somebody else. So as an example, in the accounting business, it may be the best thing you can do is to ally yourself with a legal firm. Why? Because often law firms deal with financial matters and accounting details. 
that they don't themselves don't specialize in, but they can refer you to. Um, building uh, 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 contractors may rely on architects, and it's important that uh, they get to know architects and architects know them. Each one of these things is a, a priority that you need to establish who's going to do it, by when, what's the cost. So um, here we are, we're at five and six. And again, these financials are very difficult to do, but I urge you to do them even if, the, if you have great difficulty. The first is to actually put together a P&L. You've already identified your, your revenue, uh, how many things you're gonna sell, how many products you're gonna sell, what the price of those things, what the segments are, and over time what those look like. But it's important that you guess about P&L. And every P&L is structured very similar to this. You have gross revenues, which consists of unit sales and price. Uh, you have cost of goods sold. Th this is the cost of delivering your product and service to your customers. In uh, businesses with inventory, this, ha this is it product itself, the materials, and the labor. For service businesses, this tend to be, tends to be a very small amount. It may be the labor associated with delivering your service. It, there may be no cost of goods sold in this because you, in effect, uh, don't uh, uh, have any cost burden in de delivering that. Again, usually related to service businesses. So once you've established the cost of directly delivering your product or service to the customer, you, I, that get, gets you your gross profit. And gross profit is important in part because it's a stepping stone toward um, uh, net income. Generally, businesses work to get a gross margin in the 50% range, 40, 50. Some businesses uh, demand less gross profit like um, the construction trades. But, and, and some businesses uh, expect a lot higher gross profit, like software or some services. And you can get an idea of what gross profits look like by industry by Googling it. So your target is probably going to be in the 50% gross margin range from which you deduct operating expenses. These are expenses that can't, uh, you can't directly tie to a particular transaction. It's things like rent or selling or marketing or accounting, uh, financial management. Um, these things you can't tie directly to a particular transaction, but nonetheless, they're expenses and you got to, to absorb them. So once you subtract the operating expenses from your gross profit, now you have something called operating income. It's sometimes known as EBIT. Uh, it's sometimes known as EBITDA. If you, uh, if you uh, don't count dep depreciation or amortization, but basically this is, this is income before you have to pay taxes. And once you pay your taxes, then you have to after tax profit. It's hard to estimate this for new businesses, but you ought to try. And you ought to, as you do that, you'll find that you're improving and, and your ability to precisely predict what your P&L looks like over a period of time will improve. And if uh, you're in business now and, not doing, and you're not doing this, you're missing a bet. Uh, it's really important you understand what the profitability you expect to have during the coming year. And then you'll know first or second quarter, do I even have a ghost of a chance to achieve it? By the time the third quarter rolls around, if you're in business now and you're way behind your P&L goals, you probably don't have much of a chance to achieve those goals. Um, there is a something called a cash flow statement. Um, by the way, the P&Ls and the balance sheets and the cash flow statements are all a part of reporting from any accounting package you can buy. So QuickBooks is an example. Um, th th these services allow you to install um, these accounting services on your computer, or you can ask access them on the cloud. Um, 
the cash flow st statement is important because making a sale is not necessarily getting the cash for that sale. We've already talked about accounts receivable and how they can build up and you haven't gotten the cash from that. So the question is, well, what do, does my cash look like? At the start of every month, how much money, how much cash do I have on hand? And what goes out or what comes in, which is to say sales or receivables, and what goes out in terms of inventory purchases, rent, travel, entertainment, whatever. And then what, what do I owe in the way of debt, e either in interest or principal payments as, as another cash out. And then at the end of the month, what do I have? I started with $50. I had $40 in sales. I had $60 in expenses. So what does that mean? It means I probably have a negative 40, uh, 40 bucks uh, at, in hand at the end of, of the month. Um, it's important that you understand when you're gonna be cash light because if you need the cash, it needs to come from somewhere. It may come from a savings account. It may come from a bank. It may come from your Uncle Joe, but it needs to come from somewhere and you need to understand the extent to which each month generates more or less cash and you need to be prepared for what that looks like. So that's, that's the um, cash flow statement. And those are the six steps. Analyze your market, define your marketing position, understand what your sales goals are gonna look like over some time, create an action plan that allows you to achieve those goals, and then track your progress. What's my PL look like? What's my cash flow like? And every month you check on these very important documents PL, cash flow, accounts receivable, and any action plan you need to have to either catch up to where you thought your goals were, or pare back on costs, or if you're deciding to go after new customers, well, how are you doing with that? Uh, how, uh, are you able to find these new customers? Are you able to serve these new customers and are you able to serve them profitably? So I think that we left some time for Q and A. Is, is that right? Are we all? Yes. That on yes. Time? Thanks, John. That was great. Uh, many of our uh, listeners probably don't know, but SCORE's uh, flagship workshop really is a six night presentation, usually done at libraries on developing your business plan. And since we've been unable to have live meetings and probably won't have live meetings for another couple of months at least, uh, this was a very valuable tool, John. Thanks a lot. So yes, the first question uh, from Dave said, uh, this has been very powerful and well done. He needs to uh, make sure his partner gets to, uh, to, to see this webinar. So this is a good time to remind everybody that uh, this webinar will be posted on our website underneath recorded webinars, uh, in, probably within the next day or two. So please just uh, go there, David, if you uh, want to review this and anybody else who wants to, you know, go back and look at some of the schedules. Uh, also, a lot of the templates uh, that we have on our website under, under templates cover things like marketing plans, financial projections, and business plans. Okay, we have another question. Um, under your six steps, uh, what part of the plan does the staff development, quality control, job descriptions, job review process fall into, and how important is it to deliver and in, in, in delivery to delivery and internal management, I guess? Yeah, uh, th that's a part of the operational slide. Let's see if I can show you. Yeah, so. That's, that's a part of operations. I see. So um, it's once you've been in business for a while, and if you have uh, several contractors or employees that you're relying on, it's really important that you be clear about what it is they do. Uh, not only to make sure that you're delivering uh, consistently with what your value proposition is, but that your employees don't run into one another, that they don't 
do uh, rework that others are doing or that they communicate properly or that they're paid properly. Uh, so things like job descriptions, employee manuals, uh, compensation packages that are consistent with the responsibilities. Some of that you can get just by Googling. Some of that you can get from HR services that can help you identify uh, classic kinds of job descriptions or classic kinds of compensation packages. But it's really important that you do that. And But once you've done it, then you must rely on effective communications. It's one thing to give somebody a job description and to say, do the following uh, and uh, good luck. It's all, but it's really important yet you have operational metrics. What do you expect them to do? How do you know that they're doing it? What quality metrics do you have to ensure you and your customer that this employee is doing everything they need to do? I like to think that marketing is looking at everything and anything in your company that touches the customer. Not simply ad programs, but customer service, uh, logistics, and uh, product delivery. All of that stuff customers will see and experience. And to the extent that you understand what, cust what your employees are doing to do that, you'll be better off by, by understanding the quality metrics and the performance metrics you're expecting of them. Thanks, John. Uh, David would also like to know, uh, how do you request a, a mentor? Should he do it now or, or uh, online or call up the office? Uh, actually, if you go to our website, fairfieldcounty.score.org, uh, there's a request mentor button there. You, you fill in as much information as you can, you'll be matched up with a mentor you know, in your, in your area. Uh, and uh, if you're specific about what your need is, they might even be able to match you with uh, someone who has that specific skill set you're looking for. Okay, there's another one here. I got to scroll up. We had so many questions coming in, John. Um, how do you get competitor? Uh, they, she says cost information, but I think she means price, pricing, for example, her sector caters to engineers and really her competitors don't post, you know, price information, uh, what they charge. Uh, how, how could she fill in that missing item? I know pricing is so important. Yeah, it, it is. And, and it's, it's more difficult with B2B where there isn't necessarily a, a w wide, broad understanding of pricing. Um, the first thing I suggest you do is to uh, Google, start Googling. Um, sometimes you'll see, uh, you'll come up with websites where competitors do offer some idea of what, their, of what their prices are, or at least how they structure their services. Um, it, it, there are also ways that you, uh, so there, there are uh, uh, library s uh, sources that allow you to go in and understand what the various revenue or profitability pictures are for industries in you, in, or for businesses in your industry. And you can generally discern what kinds of pricing they might have. Um, but you, you'd be surprised, you'd be amazed at the, at the amount of information you can collect either by Googling it online or by going to a library and asking the business librarian for information on businesses within a particular industry. That, that's an excellent point, John. Uh, I had a experience with, the, so there's a piece of software that most libraries in the area carry for free uh, for anybody who has a library card. Uh, one I was using was Reference USA, and it was it gives you an amazing amount of detail. He was able to determine, I don't know, it was like 39 different restaurants in his town sold pizza. And from there, you can actually get a map. You can, uh, and by the way, you can access all this information in COVID-19 time using your library card over the internet. You don't have to go into the library. So uh, it's it, there's information out there and it just takes time to, to find your way through. Yeah, uh, we might a, have time, yep. I should say one more thing. There, there, there is one way you can infer price. 
And that is to start with what you believe the costs of delivering that service might be and doubling it. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's your 50% gross margin. Right. So you start what you think the costs are, you double it, and that's probably roughly what the price is. In uh, that, that doubling may be, the, 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 the multiplier factor may be different based on the business, but you can find out the profitability of these various businesses by going to the library and asking for that reference material on uh, business and industry revenues and profitability. Right. Okay, we have another question from Andrea. Uh, with a monthly plan review, if, if we see that we are not reaching our goals, how long should we stick with a particular strategy? For example, a, a given marketing channel before making a, a change. I'm guessing we should not be making changes every month. No, <laughs> no. Generally, uh, especially if it's if it's based on some kind of uh, strategic assumption, uh, you, you're probably not going to know how valid the assumption is for at least a quarter. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't monitor your performance month by month, but you ha you should ha have un some understanding of the metrics that go into that performance analysis. Um, and uh, so, so if, for instance, part of your pr performance is based on cycle time, how fast does it, uh, does it, how fast can you turn a product around from being delivered through your door to doing whatever you're doing and sending it out? Um, or how much is customer service a part, an important part of what you offer? So you have all of these metrics associated with whatever you're delivering. You identify metrics associated with that. And you look to see, am I, am I able to improve based on this metric calculation? It may take a month, may take more, but don't wait too long. If you're a quarter out and your performance hasn't changed or, or, or your metrics haven't changed, something's wrong and you have to analyze what it is you're doing wrong and stop it. Right. Very good. Mayo needed some clarification on Reference USA. You said the website. Actually, Reference USA is the software that your library um, contracts with. You go to your library's website and there is a research section under there. You go there and there's probably several different kinds of um, business uh, access that you can get. Reference USA is one of them. Uh, there's probably some Dow Jones information and et cetera, but Reference USA is, is one of the rev, uh, information sources at the library's website. Uh, there's another one here. Uh, let's see. Uh, great presentation with businesses that produces a product. What are the most important metrics that you recommend tracking and where should you put that in the business plan? Um, that's a really hard question to answer in part because businesses differ uh, from business to business. I would say that the most important thing that you can work on is reliability of the product or service. How consistent is it over time? How fast are you able to deliver something? How many product returns do you have? Um, uh, how many late payments do you have and why? Um, th those are uh, uh, basic business metrics that allow you to understand the extent to which you are delivering consistent, uh, reliable product. The most difficult thing in my experience with business is doing it again and again and again in a reliable and consistent way. And th the first customer that you uh, frustrate uh, because you haven't done that is going to tell 10 others and it's going to hurt you. So just make sure that whatever you're doing, you're doing it consistently and then have some idea of how you can improve that over time, either in turnaround time or product quality or customer complaints or whatever. Thanks, John. That's all the questions we have time for today. 
Uh, I've already mentioned it, but you can go to fairfieldcounty.score.org website to not only sign up for future webinars, you can watch recorded webinars. There's over 100 out there, I believe. You can sign up for a mentor there. There's free uh, templates out there for business plans, marketing plans, financial projections. Can, can I add um, one thought, Tim? Sure. N never mind what I said on this presentation, get a mentor. That's the most important thing you can do. Thanks, John. So everybody have a nice day and thanks John once again. Thanks. You're welcome. Bye. Bye now.